two guys who are sitting across the table, and one fellow proposed to the other, and he said, you know, I'm thirsty. Uh, I can't quite afford a Coca-Cola, but uh, let's have a bet. I'll ask myself a question, and if I can answer it, you buy me a Coke. <laughs> guy says, that doesn't make sense. He said, no, no, no. Then you ask yourself a question, and if you answer it, I'll buy you a Coke. We'll keep going this way till one of us asks ourselves a question which we cannot answer. He said, that is strange. He said, you ask yourself a question, if you answer it, I'll buy you a Coke. I ask myself a question, if I answer it, you buy me a Coke, and we keep going till one of us asks ourselves a question we can't answer? He said, yeah. He said, it works. Believe me, it works. So he said, all right, since you proposed it, go first. He said, my question to me is this. How can a rabbit dig a hole deep into the ground without throwing mud onto the outside. And he said, my answer to my question is it should start digging from the inside. The other guy looked at him and said, how can I do that? He said, I don't know, that's your question. <laughs> Sooner or later, we run into tripping ourselves up even when we know what the stakes are. Some years ago, I heard this cute little story about a Russian, about a Texan, a sheriff who had gone into Mexico to look for a criminal who'd been plundering their banks. The criminal's name was Jose Rivera. So this sheriff from Texas with a huge girth about him went into Mexico and he was going from village to village and town to town and arrived in this bar room and he looked at the bartender and said, I hear Jose Rivera hangs around these parts. I am looking for the bandit Jose Rivera. And the bartender gradually raised his eyes and he said, see the man at the corner table there? Sure, says yes. Said, That's Jose Rivera. That's the man you're looking for. But I want to tell you, he doesn't speak English. So the sheriff said, well, you do. Why don't you interpret for me? So they walked over to the corner, and the sheriff looked at him and said, Are you Jose Rivera? And the interpreter looked at the man and says, He wants to know if you're Jose Rivera. Jose Rivera says, Send, Tell him, Yes, what about it? So he looks at the sheriff and says, Jose Rivera says, Yes, what about it? The sheriff says, Tell him that I need to know where every penny is from all these banks he's robbed, where he put it away. I want to find out where he's got them stashed. And if he doesn't tell me where it is and I don't get it back, I'm going to shoot to kill. So he looks at Jose Rivera and says, the sheriff here says, he needs every penny back. He wants to know where you've stashed all this money away, where you've put it away, and if you don't tell him where it is, he's going to shoot to kill. So Jose Rivera pauses and says, okay, tell him to step out of this bar, make a left turn, go for about 100 yards, he'll see a well. Right next to that well, he'll see a gigantic tree. Towards the portion of the well from the tree, if he digs a hole, about three feet deep, there's an encasement built out of concrete. All the bags of money are right there. Tell him he can get it and to take it and to leave me alone. So the interpreter looks at the sheriff and says, Jose Rivera says, Jose Rivera says, go ahead and shoot. Now, why do I not need to interpret that story for you? At least for most of you. Probably get it. Because you see, when the truth does not serve your purposes, all of a sudden, truth doesn't matter. When I was a little boy, I was a real rascal. A real bad boy. I, I was going to say this, but <laughs> can say who I am. I used a very nice word. And my mother was a very innocent lady. There were five of us cookie, five of us children. And she would bring cookies into the house. And she would leave it in the kitchen. 
And I would walk there and keep looking at those cookies. أخش كده وأبص على طول أعرف إيه الموضوع. And then I would look around. بعدين أبص حواليا. Take one of them. أخد واحدة. Swallow it. وأبلعها على طول. Wipe off the crumbs. بعدين أمسح ال أي أي أدلة للجريمة. Now my mother was very smart. مامتي كانت ذكية أوي. She always counted them. هي دائما كانت بتعد ال الأورس أو البسكوت الموجودة. But she was so innocent. لكن هي كانت غلبانة برضو. She would look at them. عين تبص كده. She says somebody has eaten one. بتقول في حد أكل واحدة. And she would look at me first. بعدين تبص لنا الأول. Did you eat that? انت اللي كلتها؟ And you know what I would say? ودايما كنت بقول ايه؟ Do you really think I'm that kind of person? وتقول لها <تصفيق> كان بيقول لها تفتكري انا ممكن اعمل كده؟ <تصفيق> and, the, and then she would feel so bad. وبعدين بقى تحس بذنب رهيب. <تصفيق> She'd say oh no 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 I'm so sorry I'm لا, so لا, sorry. لا لا حبيبي معلش <تصفيق> انا اسفه جدا ان انا اتهمتك. <تصفيق> See how we play with words. شايفين اللعب بالكلام ممكن يعمل ايه؟ How we use language. ازاي استخدامنا للغه. I can't help but think of a story of a gathering in an English club where there was a Japanese gentleman sitting at a table looking rather nervous and the Englishman walked in and seeing him figured he might want to instruct him on English etiquette before the meal began. So the man sat there nervously and the Englishman picked up the knife and said, this be knifey. And he picked up the fork and said, and this be forky. And this be spoony. And this be platey. And the Japanese gentleman just kept nodding very courteously. After the preliminaries were over, much to the shock of the English gentleman, the Japanese was the keynote speaker. And he got up and delivered his talk in flawless English. <laughs> and he went and sat down and looked at the Englishman and said, You like his speechy? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just tell you a little bit about my own story so you know where I'm coming from in this journey. I was born in England at a very young age. My parents moved to the Middle East, so I spent my childhood in... Um, in uh, Dubai and Sharjah in the 70s and then in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And I really knew nothing about the Christian faith. I had no Christian exposure really at all um, during my childhood. And when I was about 16, my parents moved to a country called Cyprus. Now, when my parents moved to Cyprus, I really at that stage as an older teenager, I only had one desire in life. And that desire was to be cool. I believed that if I was cool, that that would make me happy. Now, I used to watch a huge number of films, a massive number of films, a very unreasonable number of films. Cyprus had very lax interpretations of copyright laws. We could get videos on VHS, if you know what that is. If you don't know what that is, speak to someone older and wiser than you. We used to get it on video before it had its world premiere. And so... I used to want to act like I saw in the movies. And so all the images that I saw in the movies, I wanted for myself. Now, one of my heroes, um, therefore all of my heroes actually were actors. Uh, One of them was a man who amazingly has never won an Oscar despite producing an amazing and very impressive body of work. You may be familiar with him. His name is Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was someone I very much wanted to be like. One of his films starts with him walking up a mountain, carrying a tree on his shoulder. And as he has the tree on his shoulder, a whole tree, he's also smoking a cigar. And I wanted to be like him. Now, I don't have the build to carry trees. So the part of the image I could take for myself was that of smoking cigars. So I used to smoke Cuban cigars. I used to think that made me cool. Another one of my heroes was James Bond. And I wanted to be like James Bond. In the novels and in the early films, James Bond had a silver cigarette case. I had a silver cigarette case. I had my initials engraved in the bottom right-hand corner. Now, this all is true. It is sad. I'm, I'm sorry to admit it in many ways, but sadly it is true. Not only would I carry my cigarettes around in a silver cigarette case, I was so desirous to live out this image that... You know on a box of match there's a little stripe and you strike a match against it to light it. Well, I used to remove that and stick it to the bottom of my shoe. 
So having flipped open the case and flicked a cigarette into my mouth, I could take a match, light it, like I'd seen happen in the Westerns. Now I got that idea from Clint Eastwood, who for me was the coolest of them all. There was no one cooler than him. Someone was once interviewing Clint Eastwood and they said, Mr. Eastwood, why does everybody think you're so cool? And he looked at them and he took a little cigarello out of his pocket, he put it on the table, he flicked it so it started spinning in the air. While it was spinning in the air, he produced a match from his back pocket and struck it, lighted, lighting it under the table. He then caught the cigar in his mouth, lit it, inhaled very deeply, blew one big smoke ring, three little smoke rings through the big smoke ring and said, I don't know. Uh, somebody wrote to me last week, uh, you know, one of the things I really appreciate is all the advice I get. My mother-in-law is the chief of them. Uh, <clears throat> and every time she gives me some advice, I say to her, you know, Mom, I'm amazed I travel around the world and manage without all the wisdom you give along the way. And we have a marvelous relationship, I say it tongue in cheek. But uh, one gentleman wrote to me and he said, I used to live in Salt Lake and so on and so forth. He said, you know, the folks out there really love funny stories. So he said, make sure you, I don't know whether you thought my face wasn't funny enough or what it was, but uh, so let me abide by his advice because the message is going to be heavy. So I'll give you a little lighthearted story here which will segue into what I really want to say to you. You may have heard me tell this before, but it's always at least one person who hasn't. So here it is. As a bagpiper, I play many gigs. Recently, I was asked by a funeral director to play at the graveside service for a homeless man. He had no family or friends, so the service was to be at a pauper cemetery in the Kentucky backcountry. As I was not familiar with the backwoods, I got lost. I finally arrived an hour late and saw the funeral guy had evidently gone, and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only the diggers and the crew left, and they were eating lunch. I felt bad and apologized to the men for being late. I went to the side of the grave and looked down at the vault lid was already in place. I don't know what else to do, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather round. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family and friends. I played like I'd never played before for this homeless man. And as I played Amazing Grace, the workers began to weep. They wept. I wept. We all wept together. When I finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for my car. Though my head hung low, my heart was full. As I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say to another, never seen nothing like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. You know, there's uh, nothing like being at the wrong place with the wrong instrument and the wrong mood and the wrong message and hearing the right comment at the end of it all. And it's wonderful to know that, no, we're not dreaming, we are here at the Mormon Tabernacle and uh, we are guests of the leadership here. I don't know, after that talk by Pat, I just leaned over to John and said, I'm just happy to pray and get back because it's been a great uh, great morning already for you but I guess he feels I have to pay my dues so I have to say a few things but I must say when I was a teenager I used to walk around the house imitating Pat Boone <laughs> and, and, and God has a way of honoring your faith because just as I came on the platform, a gentleman from among you walked over and shook my hand and said, I'm delighted to meet you, Mr. Boone. <laughs> and I thought that's what he said. And then he went on to say, when you graduated from Columbia in 1950. So I said, I think you're mistaking me. Uh, my name is Ravi Zacharias. He said, I'm so sorry. I thought you were Pat Boone. Now, I've heard of miracles taking place in tents, but, but the trans-ethnicization of a man to look like Pat Boone from my background, that uh, I can hardly wait to get home and tell my brothers and sisters that I was called Mr. Boone. Now, next time somebody comes up to me and says, I'm delighted to meet you, Mr. Presley, 
then, uh, then we'll know 10% of the people still believe that Elvis Presley is alive. So thanks, Pat. It's great to see you, great to hear from you, and just what you've done for God across the years and for your country. Just thank your family for sparing you. We really honor you for it. Really honor you for it, yeah. I still have your LPs. I can still try to sing Bernadine, but nowhere near the way you did. You may not even remember it, but in my teens I wrote to you and you never replied. So it's happy to meet you now. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not making all this up. This is true. The story is told of these two Australian sailors who had just disembarked from a ship in England and were walking into town that night and found their way into a pub. And they enjoyed themselves throughout the evening and had one too many, walked out of that pub into a dense London fog. Completely disoriented, they were wobbling on their feet, looking around, trying to get some help, and they saw a gentleman coming into the pub, unknown to them was a highly decorated naval officer. And as he came closer, one of them said to him, say, you bloke, can you tell us where we are? The officer, quite offended, looked at the men and said, do you men know who I am? At which point, one of the sailors said to the other, we are really in a mess now. We don't know where we are, and he doesn't know who he is. <laughs> Imagine, as we begin this century, we are trying to define who we are. The following illustration, when I wrote it out, I said, oh boy, if I say this, somebody is going to wonder what I'm saying. So I'm only going to state this humorously and sarcastically. Please listen. Nowhere is our escape from reality more visible than in the cosmetic industry across this world, which tries to hide so many things. Listen, the cosmetic industry has exploded into a multi-billion dollar business churning out products to make us look better, smell better, or feel younger, and a dozen other innocent forms of disfigurement. So creams are invented to smoothen the wrinkles and patch up the cracks. Colors and dyes are created to reverse the gray in our hair. Oils are massaged into our skin to make it feel softer. And adver 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 advertisements with their blatant bunkum scream out at us that we can knock off 10 years of our apparent age if we eat, drink, sniff, or rub their product into our systems. Then what the cosmetics cannot do, surgeons say they can. They stretch our skins to make us look more youthful, implant more hair to make us look more bushy-headed, graft on skin in plastic surgery to put the dimples in the right places, and narrow the nose and chin down to look like what we wished we did. But alas, the surgeon can transplant only so much. Finally, it is cancer or a heart attack that lands us in the coffin. So what do we do? We make a final outlandish effort to slap on enough cream and dip into the mortician's cosmetic bag to make that final attempt so that everyone then passes by in that ultimate death-denying compliment. He looks just like himself, doesn't he? If there is any time in his life he doesn't look like himself. That is the time. That's why he's there. <laughs> when my daughter Sarah was only two, we were crossing over from Jordan across the West Bank into Israel. Never forget it. It was 1977. And at that time, you would cross over the Allenby Bridge. I'm sure many of you here have done that. You'd spend about two hours standing in line, and people are restless. Sarah was being held in Margie's arms, and we'd prepared her for a long day. She was a little over two. And at one point, she just looked around, and of course, the Israeli soldiers are armed to the teeth out there. She didn't know any better. She looked at one of these soldiers and said, Excuse me, sir, do you have any bubble gum? <laughs> he was stunned. He took off his gun and gave it to a colleague and came over to Margie and put his arms out to Sarah. And she went to him. He took her into a back room. I, I, now I began to get worried. <laughs> and he came back five minutes later with a tray, three glasses of lemonade on them. 
one for little Sarah, one for my wife, one for me, and he waved us over, put us in his Jeep, took us to a taxi stand, and we were on our way through Jericho into Jerusalem. Sarah earned her whole keep in that one question. (laughs) What is it that disarmed a man like that? What is it that caused a man just for a moment to forget the intensity of his role to keep guard? It was the voice of a little child and the innocence of that little child who had no clue what was really happening. My host was Sammy Dagger. If you've never been with Sammy Dagger, this side of heaven, you have missed something. He's short as a teddy bear, but he's, pardon the analogy, is like a packet of dynamite. He doesn't even say good morning without expending more energy than I would in a sermon. How are you, my brother? And he gives you that big hug. Sammy knows no fear. And his wife is English. He's Lebanese. His wife is English. Her name is Joy. She needed to have that name to put up with this guy. (laughs) And here's the story. They are driving at 11 o'clock at night and he sees a suitcase on the side of the highway sitting unattended. Only Sammy would think of getting off the car to check on it. He says, darling, There is a suitcase on the side of the road. She says, Sammy, it's not ours. In any part of Lebanon, you don't check somebody else's suitcase on the side of the road, unless you're Sammy. And he gets off and he pats it. He says, darling, it's full. She says, Sammy, leave it alone. He says, somebody must have lost it. She said, obviously. He picks it up and puts it into their van. And she's having kittens heading back home while he's celebrating that he's found somebody's suitcase. He takes it into the house and she leaves the room. He opens it. Do you know what he sees there? Every square inch money. Nobody ever has that experience and says, Why me, Lord? He dumps the money out and he sees a business card. And he looks at the telephone number and it's about midnight. He phones and a voice picks it up. And Sammy says to him, are you Mr. So-and-so? And And he said, yes, why are you calling? He says, have you lost anything? That man is in pin drop silence. He says, have you found it? (laughs) He says, yes, on the side of the road. He says, it's full of money. He says, yes, I was trying to leave the country, emptied my bank account, put it in a suitcase and tied it on the top of my car and I'm heading to the airport and it must have blown off. When I came back, I couldn't find it. Sammy says, I have it. And I don't think anything is missing. There's no room. It's full. The man is so shocked, he says, can I come? He said, no, 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 it's curfew now. If I had any other plans for your suitcase, I wouldn't be calling you. He says, you come tomorrow morning. This is my address. Pick it up. So the guy comes the next morning, picks it up. He's stunned that a man has turned in this kind of money. So he dips in and he lifts this money and he says, you're a pastor? He says, yes. He says, give this to your church. Sammy says, I only take an offering like this on Sundays. You come to church on Sunday and you put it in your side. So the guy comes to church and he puts that money in. He can't get over it. The night I was leaving, this man had come with his family. And Sammy was hosting him for tea. And then he was taking me to the port. And I'm sitting there while they're talking in their language and Sammy keeps interpreting. And then at one point, Sammy takes a Bible for him, for this man's wife, for his children. He has a Bible. And here's what he said. You thought you had lost your treasure. He said, who really wants Lebanese money? He said, you thought this was treasure? He said, I'll give you the treasure that moth will not devour, that thieves cannot break into steel, 
and he gave every one of them a Bible. This man could not stop weeping. And the tears are running down his face. He takes that Bible and kisses it and holds it against his arm. And I watched as Sammy had the privilege of praying with this family and giving them the greatest treasure they could ever own, the Word of God. This evening, while we were walking out of the hotel, my travel associate, Philip, and I could have been rather flattered, thinking there were 75 cameras lined up and a big crowd outside our hotel. As we waved, you know. Probably we could have thought, wonderful, they're coming to see Ravi and Philip leave the hotel. But nobody batted an eyelid. Suddenly, Ruben didn't bat an eyelid. He was just quite happy we were ordinary people. They were not there for us. They were there for the two cricket teams. <laughs> but you know what? It's a great game. But it's only about a bat and a ball, you know. I love cricket. And I think of the emotional energy people spend. I mean, I love sports. You wonder, pagal ho gaya, kya ho gaya? What has happened? <laughs> great batsman, great ball, and that's fine. I'm very, very happy if India beats up everybody. <laughs> but that in itself is a pipe dream. You feel like saying, oh Lord, will you not please allow uh, to happen? You know, some, some months ago, somebody told me this. This is no longer true, and I'm so glad. I'm a cricket fan, by the way. Somebody said about this couple that went to court and they were wanting to separate and the little boy was to be awarded. And so the judge said, I think I will award him to his father. And the little boy said, no, 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 please don't do this because my father beats me. He said, okay, then I'll give you to your mother. He said, please don't do this, judge. My mother beats me too. He says, then what am I, what am I going to do? He said, I think I'll give you to the Indian cricket team. They don't beat anybody. <laughs> I'm glad it's not true anymore. The boys are doing well. Maybe my life is in danger when I go back to the hotel tonight. Now, pause for laughter here. I was in Jordan, and uh, I had gone into a shop in Amman to have a passport photograph taken, and the missionary had taken me there, and the missionary was talking to the man across the counter. There were all kinds of Muslim people sitting around in benches. We were just sitting there, huddled up. And the missionary decided to introduce me to the photographer or the owner of the store and to tell him that I was speaking at the YMC at night, he'd be very welcome to come. And he says, ah, Hindu, which is Arabic for Indian, and he reached out and gave me a clasp, very appreciative of the Indian people and so on. So then uh, uh, Norm, the missionary, said to him, uh, he is not a Hindu by religion, he is an Indian, but he's actually a Christian. He's a follower of Christ. That stopped him for a moment and he said, oh. Then he says to Norm to ask me what I think of Muhammad. How do you like that? You know, that's your, this allowed conversation going through an interpreter. And he wants me to answer what I think of Muhammad. Well, all these Muslim men and women are sitting around there waiting for their photograph to be taken. So I looked at Norm Camp and I said, look, Norm, why don't you answer it since I don't speak his language? Uh, he said, no, 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 he's asked you. You know, that's really like saying, do you want to be shot or lynched or whatever? Then I said, do you really want me to answer it? He said, yeah. I said, all right. Tell me something. Was Jesus a prophet? He said, yes. Number two, I said, was Muhammad a prophet? He said, yes. I said, can a prophet lie? He paused on that one. Because if he'd said yes, then he's got a problem with Muhammad. If he said no, he's going to have a king-size headache with Jesus on that issue. You know, can a prophet of God lie? 
He paused a long while and said, no. I said, Jesus was a prophet. Muhammad said Jesus was a prophet. Okay, yes, yes. And a prophet cannot lie. So that's right. I said, now, Jesus claimed to be the only way to God. I said, if Jesus is right, Muhammad is wrong. On the other hand, if Jesus is wrong, Muhammad is still wrong because he said Jesus was right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that is the most accurate introduction I've ever had about me. <laughs> because the less said, the better. Uh, because I have got more degrees while I'm being introduced than I ever got when I was going and studying. Uh, I've had more things said about me that have happened that probably never did. But it sounds extremely good. It's like the guy who was introduced to speak at a conference and they were, they were told as an audience that this man made a ten million dollar profit in the stock market in New York and he was going to talk about it and so when a man stood up he said I want to make a few corrections it really wasn't ten million it was twenty million it really wasn't dollars it was pounds it wasn't in New York it was in London it wasn't me, it was my brother. <laughs> and it wasn't made, it was lost. So, better not to have a video and not disappoint than to have a video and then disappoint. Caleb, great to see you here. I wish I could read his letter to you. I just, I was flying back from Thailand three, four days ago and on my way to LA to do an open forum at UCLA when my staff had sent me this letter and I started reading it about him wishing I would come to his place for Thanksgiving. And by the time he described the menu, I was salivating and longing to dig into those mashed potatoes and made me want to look forward to Thanksgiving next year. Caleb, I hope I'll do it someday, but two days in the year, my family will never let me go. That's Christmas and Thanksgiving. So maybe sometime in the year, if you hold a, hold a mock Thanksgiving dinner, we'll come and celebrate it together. But your mom did a great job writing that letter, and I'll treasure your letter. It's on my Blackberry. I remember when I was at graduate school, um, sent my doctrinal examination question. And we had these tiny little apartments and you had to get no help, just your Bible next to you and it was a multiple page thing. And the opening question was, God is perfect, explain. So I turned to my wife and said, the only more difficult thing I could think of is define God and give two examples. Now, the fascinating thing, the fascinating thing about that question is there was just this much of space in which to do the explaining. And I was grateful for that because the longer the answer, the greater the possibility of heresy on something like that. So I answered in one line. He's the only entity in existence, the reason for whose existence is in himself. All other entities or quantities exist by virtue of something else. And in that sense, he alone is perfect. My honor to be with you here at Princeton. Well, I was in Germany. India, very close to Bangladesh. George Washington University. In the Middle East. Meetings in Angola, prison. United States. From China. In Canada. In the United Kingdom. In Istanbul, in Ankara, and Izmir. Romania. At American University. In the University of Harvard. In Manila, in the Philippines. Perth, Australia. To uh, South Africa. In Africa. So the global family of humanity is really like what John Wesley would have said, the world is our parish.